Okay, so let's start. Okay, so good morning everyone and uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, so virtually here <laughs> and yeah, so it's we are closer to Easter and I thought it was a good idea to make this presentation uh, before the end of the week. Uh, and also, I mean, if I had waited for maybe a couple more weeks, there would have been maybe 10 more different transformer models uh, published in the meanwhile. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, stuff going on at the moment uh, in computer vision uh, using transformers. So I have put on this first slide Optimus Prime because Today we are talking about, we are going to talk about transformers and in particular how to send, how to use a transformer uh, with satellite images. Um, so the outline for this presentation is this one. So at the beginning, I'm just going to give you an overview of the project, the Leo project, and which is still uh, going on. And so so another, uh, one important thing I want to uh, say is, so this presentation will mainly focus on the machine learning side of the project. So I'm not going to talk about any hardware details, also because the uh, MAU team is still working on that. So the project is still going on. So uh, after this introduction, um, I need to give you some uh, information about the basic concepts behind the vision transformer. And those are the attention. And I would also talk about the original transformer model, which was used initially for natural language processing tasks. After that, uh, I will be able to um, explain how a vision transformer works, which is a model developed by Google um, and applied mainly to computer vision tasks. And then I will also talk about the data efficient image transformer, which is the improved version developed by Facebook. Uh, and then, yeah, at the end, uh, I will talk about how uh, I was able to reduce the complexity and the memory requirements of all of these models. And of course, I will show you <coughs> some numerical results and also uh, a nice demo at the end with some pictures and video. All right, so first of all, let's look at the satellite industry uh, now. So I have taken this data from uh, the last report uh, from the Satellite Industry Association uh, published in summer last year. And the main point I want to make here is that if you look on the left hand side, we can see that there's an increasing number of satellites used for different purposes. Uh, so the allocation of uh, yeah, satellites to different kinds of projects can vary throughout the year, but uh, yeah, there's the, the orange line which tells us that there's an increasing number of uh, missions that uses satellites for different purposes. And on the right hand side instead, uh, in terms of revenues, uh, there's a huge portion of those revenues that are generated from projects uh, applied to uh, agriculture, uh, disaster mitigation, or in general to research projects uh, in the space science domain or earth science domain. Um, so if we just focus on what what's happening in the UK, so it seems that the UK government has created several 1 million grants as part of 22 million pounds made available by the Transforming Food Production Challenge, which aims to uh, transform to, to, to meet the needs of a growing population and yeah basically transform how farming is done and machine learning is an important part of many of these projects and so Leo is the project that we are currently working on it's a research project and it's a demonstrator for robotics and AI in extreme and challenging environment the objective is to enable satellites with onboard image recognition based on deep learning models. Uh, LEO is not a name that we invented, but LEO stands for Low Earth Orbit. And here you can understand what is this orbit. Uh, so the red arrow shows the, the area where the LEO uh, stands. And LEO is basically 
less than a uh, thousand kilometers above Earth, but it could be also as low as 160 kilometers uh, above Earth. And by comparison, most commercial airplanes do not fly at an altitude which is much higher than 14 kilometers. Uh, why is LEO so important and commonly used for many missions? Uh, so unlike satellites in the geo area, which is on the right hand side, that must always orbit along Earth equator because they have to uh, maintain the same position relative to the, I don't know, the communication center uh, on Earth. LEO satellites do not always have to follow a particular path around Earth. Uh, so their plane can be tilted. And this means that there are many more available routes uh, for satellites in this area. And also the other advantage is that being near the surface of the Earth um, allows them to take images with higher resolution. Uh, in all cases, so uh, with satellites uh, in all of these areas, the main problem is that uh, battery life and throughput are key and we can't use uh, power hungry CPUs or GPUs like the one that I used uh, to train and test my models uh, and that we have in the office. And so now that we know where these satellites uh, go, uh, let's talk about the data. So I have used to train and test my models uh, the RISC-45 dataset, uh, which consists of uh, 31,500 remote sensing images that have been collected by experts in the field of remote sensing uh, from Google Earth. Uh, so there are 45 classes. You can see four samples on the right and 700 images for each class. And all images have the same size, uh, the same dimensions, which is 256 by 256 uh, in the RGB color space. The spatial resolution um, can be different and for different classes. Uh, so it can go from 30 meters per pixel to 0.2 meters per pixel. For, and so there are some exceptions. Uh, so there are pictures that show islands, lakes, mountains that have a much lower spatial resolution. But in most cases, this is the range where most of the images uh, are. And yeah, so this data set covers more than 100 countries and regions all over the world. Cool. So now that we know also the data that I have used, I can talk about uh, the theory behind transformers. So the first thing I want to talk about is attention. So attention is to some extent motivated by how uh, we human, human beings pay visual attention to different regions of an image, but also how we correlate words in a single sentence. Uh, so for example, in this image, uh, I can pay more attention, so I can visualize in my head with high resolution, just the, the uh, specific, the center part of the, the image, while perceiving the surrounding image in low resolutions. Uh, and this depends on the task also I need to, I need to do. And for example, I can take the same image and I can crop a small patch. The objective is to understand what's missing in that patch. In order to do that, I can, for instance, look at other patches. I can see a nose, I can see an ear, I can see the left eye. And what I can infer is that in the missing patch, there is another eye. So what I'm not doing is looking at, I don't know, stones, the, the background, because that doesn't contain any useful information for the kind of inference I want to do. So how do we apply this uh, technique in machine learning? So the first, uh, one of the first applications uh, for attention uh, was in neural machine translation. So we have an input sentence in a language, say English, and we want to translate it into another language, say German. And in previous uh, models, with previous approaches, what they did is they had an encoder, like the one that we have here in this slide, and we just create a context vector out of the encoder's last hidden state. Um, and that's then used to do something at the end. So here with attention, is there's something different, because as you can see in the red 
uh, dashed area. Uh, attention uh, creates lots of shortcuts between the context vector and the entire source input. So the context vector basically has to be a lower dimensional representation of the whole input. So we need a representation uh, that is low dimension, but still contains all the useful information that I need to, in this case, translate a sentence into another language. Um, and yeah, so at the end there is, of course, the, the decoder. It can be whatever you want. I mean, in this case, it is an RNN uh, model, which takes the context vector and outputs uh, the single words in German. The equations that are used for this model are this one. So the first equation just defines the decoder hidden state. It is a function of the previous decoder hidden state of the previous word uh, in German and the context vector uh, of the English sentence. So the context vector is instead a sum of hidden states in the second equation um, of the input sequence weighted by the alignment scores. The alignment scores, which are the alphas, the red alphas, uh, are the ones that are computed with attention. And the alpha ti simply represents how well the pair of input at position i and output at position t match. Uh, the definition of matching uh, I mean, depends on the, uh, the score function you use. In this case, we have a softmax, that's why there is the exponential function. And the score function is um, parameterized by a feedforward network with a single hidden layer and a hyperbolic tangent as um, activation function. Uh, so this is not exactly what is used in a transformer model because we use um, a variation of attention, which is called self-attention. Self-attention is basically the same as the, the methods we, we saw before, but the only difference is that the target sequence, y, is equal to the input sequence. And the objective is to relate different positions of a single sequence in order to compute a representation of the same sequence. It can be used for different applications like machine reading, summarization, image description generation, and on, on the right, you can see two examples uh, where such a method has been used to generate um, a caption for each single image. Uh, so the, the white uh, area on the right indicates the attended regions. So when the model was uh, generating the output dog or bird, uh, he was, it was focusing on the, the pixels highlighted by uh, the white uh, area. So in, this, in the second case, uh, yeah, the, the output word was not correct, but still the model was focusing on the uh, right pixels uh, to understand uh, what kind of animals uh, was that. Okay, so now that we know how uh, self-attention works, finally, I can talk about transformers. Just like in modern physics, EMC squared is like one of the most important and famous equations. Well, in the world of transformers, the equation that you see on the top right is the core. Uh, if we want to compare these equations to what we saw before in uh, neural machine translation, we can say that the key value pairs, um, basically the, the K and the matrices in that equation, are the encoder hidden states while the query, Q, the Q matrix, represents the, the previous output. Uh, attention in this case is called, is used um, in a way, it's called scaled dot product attention, and it is, so the output is a weighted sum of the values, B, where the weight that you assign to each value is determined by the dot product of the query with all keys. This is what is represented in the gray box on the right. Um, in the middle, there's another gray box where it, that is called multi-head attention, which basically tells us that there are many of uh, many scaled dot product attention that are done in parallel. And this is done 
uh, because we want to allow the model to attend to information from different representation subspaces. And if we look on the uh, left diagram, then we can see an architecture that is similar to the previous one. We have an encoder uh, that generates an attention-based representation and a decoder, which instead takes that representation uh, and is able to retrieve useful information uh, to generate some output. And that depends on the task uh, we want to solve. Uh, so it can be different words in, uh, the, and in another language if we want to apply to neural machine translation. An important thing to notice here is that if you look at the bottom, um, close to the inputs and uh, outputs, there's something called posi positional encoding. So the problem with transformers is that a transformer um, doesn't know anything about the fact that there's some sort of uh, temporal or spatial relationship uh, between the input elements. So it doesn't know that, for example, a word at the end of a phrase comes after the, the first word. So we have to tell the model uh, the position of all input elements with respect to uh, every other element. And that's why we need that positional uh, position information. All right, so how do we apply this model in computer vision? So in the last probably 10 years, uh, CNNs have been uh, the main type of model used for all sorts of uh, computer vision tasks from object detection to classification, segmentation. And the, the benefit of using CNNs with respect to older traditional approaches was that uh, CNNs uh, don't need any hand-designed visual features. Uh, so they can learn to perform specific tasks end-to-end directly from data. And there are some properties uh, that are uh, useful, especially when you apply CNNs to computer vision tasks to images and those are translation invariants so in this example the dog can be on the left on the right in the middle uh, it can be big small but the CNN is able to uh, to do the same kind of prediction uh, so it doesn't have any problem uh, making prediction uh, in these cases and also the other property is the, the fact that it has locally restrictive receptive field uh, so the convolution operation just takes into account a um, few pixels around a specific area, especially in the first layers that are closer to the input image. And this is useful for um, yeah, image tasks because um, pixels that are closer to each other are highly correlated. Uh, so do we need a domain-specific design like this to, to solve computer vision tasks? Or could we successfully leverage a more domain agnostic or efficient architecture to achieve this, the same state-of-the-art results? Well, the answer is yes, uh, we can use transformers. And that's why Google last year came up with a vision transformer. Uh, so on the, on the right, uh, we have the same transformer encoder that we saw before. So nothing has changed. In that case, it's exactly the same. There are only um, some additional bits uh, on the, in the left diagram uh, that had to be used in order to, uh, to make it work with uh, computer vision tasks. So let's go through the training process. Uh, so we have an input image on the bottom left. We split an image into patches, in this case, nine patches, and then we flatten those patches. Uh, so we we lose the 2D structure of the image. Then we produce a lower dimensional uh, linear embeddings from those flattened patches. And as I said before, we need to add a positional encoding. So you can see those numbers closer to, uh, close to the projection of the uh, input patches. Uh, and then there's a sequence of different transformer encoder blocks. Uh, but at the end, we don't have a decoder, so we don't need that. Uh, in this case, it's just an MLP at the end, a multi-layer perceptron with, that outputs directly the, the, the class, 
because this is applied to image classification. There's another thing that have that has been added uh, to this model, and it is the, the embedding corresponding to position zero. So as you can see, we have yeah all patches from one to nine, but there's also something else which is uh, which has embedding uh, position embedding zero. That corresponds to the classification token. Um, this is something that is has also been used um, for other models, and uh, it is used especially when you want to train and test the model with images uh, of different sizes. So let's say you want to increase the image size and um, you don't want to change basically the architecture. Uh, with the classification token, you can do that because at the end, the MLP takes just the data coming from uh, that path, the classification token path. And this works simply because the attention, as we saw before, uh, connects every uh, head, every neuron uh, in the transformer encoder with all the other ones, in a way. Yeah. So even if you add other patches at the end, uh, the classification token will always uh, consider in some way the information coming from the additional patches. Okay, so one of the... Um, weak point of this architecture is the fact that it still needs a lot of data. Um, so yeah, we haven't solved this issue uh, because with CNN, we also needed a lot of data. With a vision transformer, again, we need a lot of data. And the problem is that we need even more data because uh, we need the model needs to learn both the inductive biases that are available for free in a CNN uh, plus the how to solve the task. But let's first see uh, the difference between a CNN and a vision transformer. Uh, so in these diagrams, um, I have put the receptive field and the mean attention distance uh, for a vision transformer on the left and for a normal CNN on the right. Uh, so let's just focus on the left um, data that represents the um, receptive field in the first layer. If we look at the uh, COMP CNN architecture, we can see that the receptive field is pretty small because at the end we can just look at the 3x3 three three kernel. So we can't look at other pixels that are far away. On the other hand, uh, the vision transformer uh, is able to look at uh, pixels that are uh, far apart uh, because with different heads and with all these interconnections um, well the the self-attention methods allows the model to uh, focus on almost the whole uh, image uh, in the first layer and this can be a critical point uh, if we want to give a justification for the um, performance of the, the vision transformer compared to a CNN and another thing that I want to say is that um, on the right, that's basically a 24 co uh, CNN architecture, 24 layers uh, CNN model. And we need such a deep model to have a receptive field, which is around 50. But with the same number of layers, with a vision transformer, we can have a much uh, bigger receptive field or mean attention distance, which basically represent the same thing. And this means that uh, we don't need uh, super deep models like with CNN. Um, so another thing, uh, another good advantage uh, of the vision transformer compared to the CNN is that so the vision transformer can learn the features that are hard coded into a CNN, but it's also free to learn more generic patterns. And that's why this can be an important step towards uh, a more general model that can be applied to uh, different domains, different tasks. But as I said before, uh, we need a lot of data. So how can we solve this problem? But Facebook, uh, a few months later, uh, developed this model, and this is called Data Efficient Image Transformer. The architecture is the same as the, uh, the one we saw before. So nothing major changed. 
the main difference is in the better training strategy. In particular, they used uh, what is called distillation, where there's one neural network, the student, that learns from the output of another network, the teacher. Uh, so why do we need that? Uh, well, because especially when you use a lot of data documentation, you can have you can have um, misalignments between the uh, modified images and the label. So let's say we have an image with a small cat, and after the documentation, that cat gets cropped. So at the end, we have an image with a cat label, but we can't see the cat. So with um, distillation, we can partially solve this issue because the model is able not only to learn uh, through strong supervision, which means from the label data set, but also from the predictions that are given by the teacher. Um, so in order to separate these two tasks um, in the student model, which is learn from the, the teacher and learn from the uh, label data set, what they did is they used a class token and a distillation token. So that's why you see those two paths uh, going towards two different loss uh, terms. So the equations for this, um, for distillations are these ones. So the first equation is uh, represent the soft distillation approach, which is the, the older approach. Whereas the, the second equations represent the, the method used by Facebook in this paper. So the main diff so in both cases, we have the first term that represents the difference, the loss with respect to the label data set. And the second one represents the, the difference, the loss uh, between the student predictions and the teacher ones. So the difference is in the weights that you give to both terms. Uh, so Facebook uh, decided to put one half for both of them. And also, when you look at the loss between the student and the teacher, we don't use anymore the uh, teacher logits, but directly the, the hard label coming from the, the teacher. And this has been proven to, uh, to get better results at the end. So that's why uh, they have decided to go, uh, to go with the second method. OK, so finally, uh, I'm able to, to talk about how I was able to uh, compress, reduce the complexity, the computational complexity, but also the memory requirements of these models. The first technique I used is quantization. Uh, quantization, we know that very well because, uh, so quantization is basically reducing the, bit, the number of bits of the data type or using uh, a less expensive format, for example, integer instead of floating point. Uh, these are uh, some of the uh, numerical formats that, he, that I've used uh, in my experiments. And another thing to, to say is that, yeah, quantization can be applied both after training, and we call it post-trained quantization, but also during training. And in that case, we talk about quantization-aware training. The second method that I used uh, to accomplish my compression task was sparsity. Uh, sparsity means we want to prune some weights because uh, in most cases we know that uh, models are over parameterized so there are too many parameters and the model is too complex uh, so it is able to, to solve the same task with less weights. So how uh, do we decide which weights uh, to prune? Uh, so one method that is also the one that I have used is the magnitude based one. So we decide which weights to prune based on their magnitude. If they are closer enough to zero, then we can prune them. Um, there are, of course, many more methods that you can build on top of this magnitude-based pruning. They can be, you can use a structured approach where you can prune an entire channel, entire layer. Uh, so basically there's some sort of structure pattern in the way you decide what to prune. On the other side, there's an unstructured uh, way of pruning, which means that there are no constraints on the sparsity pattern. 
This typically results in the smallest quality, uh, quality degradation, but it's also the most challenging uh, to deploy efficiently. And then we have something that's in the middle. Uh, so it's balanced sparsity, block-based balanced sparsity, which basically is, so we take this, the weight matrix, we uh, create blocks of, say, four values. So we have an overall uh, structure in the way we divide the, the, the weight matrix. And inside each of those blocks, we decide to, to prune 50% of the weights. Uh, in this case, two. The examples that I have put on the slides represent the two to four sparsity used by NVIDIA, uh, which is uh, yeah, if, um, a block-based uh, balanced sparsity pattern with a target sparsity of 50%, and which is one of the methods that I used in my experiments in addition to uh, unstructured uh, patterns. All right, so now it's time to talk about experiments. So in the last few months, I have done 123 experiments, which could go from a couple of minutes for the easiest ones to 19 hours for the longest one. And I have generated three terabytes of data, which are now in GCP. Uh, I'm not going to show you, of course, the results of all uh, experiments, otherwise we would, it would take forever. But I will show you just a summary of the main results. So here are the quantization results. Um, so in this case, I have applied post-train quantization to all layers except the attention operations, simply because there was a problem, a compatibility problem with um, a PyTorch uh, that was uh, not supporting uh, a specific type of operation. So the dot product that is done in attention. And as you can see uh, on the left, uh, there are all the vision transformers uh, models. On the right, there are the data efficient image transformers. Uh, in many cases, the data efficient image transformer has performed better, and you can see an accuracy which is slightly higher, especially for the, the biggest model. Uh, but yeah, you know, in terms of numerical formats, they all gave the same. Uh, accuracy at the end, more or less. Um, so if you look at um, the results on the right for the data efficient image transformer, you can see that the intake format was giving us um, a lower accuracy. Uh, but yeah, so we can say that the quantization was all right, so the, the models uh, were able to get more or less the same accuracy. So let's look instead at what happened with sparsity. Uh, this is again on the left vision transformers, on the right data efficient image transformers. They have the same number of parameters, but the only thing that changed uh, is the uh, training process. In this case, uh, we can start from the left, uh, where there are the dense version of the model, and then we go through the 2 to 4 sparsity pattern, and then all the other patterns from 50% sparsity to 96.8% uh, sparsity um, represent the unstructured sparsity experiment that I have done. Uh, especially for the smallest model, the VIT tiny and the DEIT tiny, we can see that the performance um, decreases a lot, uh, especially when you go to higher uh, sparsity levels. But this is, of course, uh, expected because the number of parameters is already small uh, in the dense version. Instead, what we can see uh, for the biggest model, uh, if you look at the DEIT base, the, the yellow line on the right, we can see that uh, the model is able to get an even better accuracy with a 75% sparsity compared to the, to the dense version. And this is a well-known um, uh, thing that we know um, because, yeah, as I said, many models, uh, also in this case, the DIT base, which had, I think, 86 million parameters, was basically over-parameterized. Uh, and the number of weights could be reduced uh, without affecting the resulting accuracy, but actually improving it slightly. 
This is instead a combination of sparsity plus quantization. Um, again, this is post-train quantization plus sparsity. Uh, again, we see a decreasing um, line for more or less all models, uh, because when you go to higher sparsity pattern, where you lose a lot of um, representation power in the model. But still, the quantization was not affecting significantly the results. Um, okay, so these are some numerical results. There are many more experiments that I have done uh, with all sorts of combinations, but the, these are probably the main ones. So now it's time to look at some uh, nice pictures. For the nice thing about attention is that you can see uh, what the model was focusing on during uh, inference. And this is one example. Uh, these are two images taken from the RISC-45 dataset. Um, and the, I have created two types of attention maps that you can see on the right. And I have used a method that is called attention rollout, which basically combines, multiply uh, the matrices, the attention matrices uh, between every two layers. And so, so you, you try to understand what's the attention flow uh, throughout all the transformer blocks. And what you can do then is, for example, you can take the attention map with the maximum value among all the attention heads, or you can take the minimum, or you can take the average. So there are many things, many variation. And so this is a basic version of uh, this algorithm, which takes just the maximum value uh, among all the attention heads matrices. Um, and yeah, it's nice to see that the model uh, was actually focusing on the uh, right pixels, so for the uh, airplane uh, picture or the basketball court uh, pictures, the model was focusing on the uh, right area. Even though in the bottom examples, uh, yeah, it was focusing also on uh, the bottom right corner, which was not correct. But still, the output prediction was correct. All right, so. Um, this is taken, as I said, from the uh, Brzezisk 45 dataset. But now, what I decided to do is also taking the same models and generating the same attention maps also on random YouTube videos uh, with images taken from drones. And this is the result. Wait a second. And there we go. In this, case, in this case, yeah, the, the prediction is correct. You can see the prediction on top and the attention maps on the bottom. Uh, yeah, it is going uh, pretty well. Uh, in this case, uh, yeah, it is focusing on so many different areas, uh, even though yeah, the, the prediction is correct. Here, the prediction is not correct. At the beginning, it was stadium, correct, but then it became shape. Uh, this case is correct. So as I said, these are random images. So the model has never seen any images like this. So the, the images that I've used are taken from satellites. But yeah, the model is doing a good job. All right. And not again. And yeah, that's that's all for me. So with that, I can conclude. And I hope you found it interesting. And now you probably know how to send a transformer into space. <laughs>